Well, it's my great pleasure today to have the chance to speak with my uh, colleague and dear friend, Professor Martha Nussbaum, uh, about her new book, Citadels of Pride, Sexual Assault, Accountability, and Reconciliation. Here is the book. Um, professor Nussbaum is uh, an eminent philosopher and law professor. She is the recipient of many awards and prizes, uh, including the 2016 Kyoto Prize, and the 2021 Holberg Prize. And she has written extensively about uh, about uh, the emotions uh, and about uh, the role of women and women in society and how law treats women. And this book uh, is, sits at the intersection of many of her uh, greatest contributions and interests over the past uh, several decades. So um, Martha, it's, it's great to be here with you. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for, for doing this. It's great to be here with you. So the central argument of this book is that sexual assault and sexual harassment are founded on objectification of other people, and then in particular on the vice of pride. So I was hoping you could start out by saying a little bit about um, the relationship between objectification and sexual assault and sexual harassment, and then maybe in particular, why the vice of pride and what the connection between pride and those, um, and those offenses is. Yeah, well, objectification really means to treat as a thing what is really a person deserving of respect. And of course, I think this happens in many domains of life. There's racial objectification. There's objectification of the animals <clears throat> who I, I think should be treated as, as full persons, but that's a different topic. And, and, but women are very often treated as things rather than as full people. Now that means more than one thing. First, it means the woman is being denied full human autonomy, choice, things don't choose. It means also that the person is being denied subjectivity. You don't worry about what a thing is thinking and feeling. And then it also means a kind of fungibility. One is treated as like another. You can plug one into the place of the other. They're all just similar cogs in, in the machine. So, so that's something that feminists have long felt and long complained about. <clears throat> but underlying it, I want to say, is a, is a vice. And it's, I, I call it pride from Latin superbia, it's from Dante that I take my description of it. This is the vice where you really don't think anything outside yourself is fully real. It's kind of narcissism, but uh, the proud in purgatory are bent over like hoops, Dante says, so they can't even look out, they can only see themselves. Now, of course, you can have this in one domain of life and not in another. You could have class pride without having race pride or gender pride. You could have race pride without having class pride and so on. But it's fair to say, I think that for many, many centuries, if not millennia, most men have had some degree of pride with respect to women. They treat them as supports, instruments for their own purposes. And therefore they don't fully investigate what they're thinking and feeling, don't fully allow them autonomy. So by getting a this vice, I think we come to a different understanding of how objectification really comes about. So I think that um, legal scholars and feminist scholars for many years have talked about sexual assault and sexual harassment as, um, as really sort of centered on notions of power and domination and that they, they represent you know, attempts by the assaulter or by the harasser to exert some sort of power or authority over um, the person who is being victimized. And I was wondering, I mean, do you think of that as connected with pride or as stemming from pride? Or, or what do you think of as the sort of relationship between those conceptions? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, of course, it's closely connected. And I agree with this feminist tradition that 
sexual assault and sexual harassment are not about desire, they're about power. But the question is, you know, why, when you're in a position of power, do you then use that power in such a malign way? Use it to demean and to treat as a mere thing. You don't always do that. You and I are both parents, and I think we know that parents can be in a position of power over their children without exercising that power in an objectifying way, but in a, in a very careful and nurturing way. So the question is then, when does power go bad? And I think it goes dead when it's combined with this kind of prideful narcissism where things outside yourself don't seem to be fully real. Mm -hmm. So one of the book's many virtues is that it really traces the development of the law of sexual assault and sexual harassment over the past several decades. And as the book spells out, the law has really changed quite tremendously over the past 40 or 50 years. So I was hoping you could say a little bit about that. What have been the sort of major developments in the law and the major changes over that time um, that have been of particular relevance to, uh, to, to the, you know, the people who might be victimized by sexual assault or sexual harassment? Yeah, well, this was one of the things I really wanted to do because I began writing this book while the Kavanaugh hearings were going on. And I realized that people don't really understand the law. They don't understand what the law is. They don't understand the distinction between sexual assault and sexual harassment in two, two very different domains of law. And they also don't know the history. So the, they think that the Me Too movement started everything, just like in 2017, suddenly women began to complain. But I wanted to show that it's really a long story. The complaints, of course, go way, way, way back. But the actual turning of complaint into legal action goes at least back to the 1970s. So let's take first sexual assault. The funny thing about sexual assault that I try to portray is that it's be, being a criminal law, it's in the domain of each state. So states can vary quite a lot and it's a very messy area to reform in because you've got to go to each state, but states do imitate one another. So it used to be in around 1970, when I was heading off to graduate school, that if you were assaulted to get a conviction for rape, you had to show that you had struggled. You would put up what was called earnest resistance. And of course that was something that you were told you shouldn't do because the man might be armed and it's very dangerous to do that, but you still couldn't get a conviction. So women wanted to get to the point first of saying that the mere no really means no. That took about 12 years or so in the early 80s. By that time, in this famous case that the movie The Accused is based on, which I think is a wonderful movie. I'd love to show it to my law students to show what can be achieved by good lawyering. But that was the case where a woman who had gone to a bar to buy cigarettes, and then she had danced in a flirtatious manner with some men, then she was gang raped. And she had said no again and again and again. But then the defense tried to say, oh, well, but she led them on. They became aroused and they couldn't stop. But this jury actually found that her no was sufficient. So that was a real landmark. But it wasn't enough because sometimes there's a woman who doesn't actually say no, but she's just paralyzed with fear. So I talk about a number of cases like that. You're out in the forest preserve and some guy lifts you off your bicycle and says, come with me into the woods. My girlfriend doesn't satisfy my needs. And this poor woman, her, the conviction was thrown out because she hadn't actually said no. Well, what was she going to do in the forest preserve like, with no one around? So that had to come in, the requirement of some kind of affirmative consent. And that has made it into the law of most states by now but it's still not secure. But then there's a further problem. Sometimes the woman actually says yes, but it's tainted. It's like extortion. So if I say to you, in, in a, you know, I'm your high school principal, pay me $500 or I'm not gonna let you graduate, everyone would be clear that that was a criminal offense, that that's extortion. But when the principal says, sleep with me or you don't graduate, he got off. So we need to recognize that in sex, as in finance, there can be extortion. So that's the next phase. And we're still working through that. But I think there's greater recognition that that, that, that is a criminal offense. And then there are other things. There are cases where 
there's just an asymmetry of power that you can't remove so that no consent can remove the taint, such as between psychotherapist and patient, between prison guard and prisoner. So in all these areas, the law has gradually tended to adopt a, a strict liability approach where you, you just can't do it. Whether the woman says yes or no, it, it's just illegal. Um, so th those are some of the major changes, but we're still awaiting some more. I think, what, I mean, one thing that you're describing here very importantly was the movement in the law from treating rape as, as, a, as a crime of force um, to treating rape as a crime that involved the absence of consent. And as you said, it used to be that the nearly every state, and, and in fact, this is still true for many states, required force or a threat of significant force as a key element before a rape prosecution could succeed. Now, many states have um, changed their laws and reformulated it in terms of consent. I mean, one important thing is that it puts the, um, the, the person in the driver's seat in some sense is no longer the, um, the, the, the criminal defendant, the, the victimizer, but, it, but it's the person who is being assaulted. And so it's their consent that becomes central. So that movement from force to consent um, has really been critical in the law and, and critical to the decisions in these cases, as you described. How did that change come about? Is, is this just sort of change in social attitudes about um, sexual relations or were there sort of concerted legal reform movements or how did we get to this point? There were indeed a lot of feminist lawyers both male and female who were working hard on this and going to the politicians. And it just, I mean, what I wanted to show is Me Too is thought of as the creation of a few high profile celebrities. Here were a lot of unknown people in the trenches, both the lawyers and the plaintiffs, and so this, uh, well, when we get to sexual harassment, it's the plaintiffs who are willing to go to court. And yeah, it just took a very long time and it's still incomplete. I think it's useful to think of the parallel to what's happened in medical care. It used to be in 1970s that if the doctor thought it was good to do a colonoscopy, he just did it. If he thought it was good to do surgery, he just did it. And there was a revolution. And I remember this because my colleague at Brown, Dan Brock, was the one who started that revolution. He wrote a book called Deciding for Others, talking about, you know, you can't just take it upon yourself because you think it's a good idea to decide for others. You've got to get informed consent. Now, that happened in a more centralized way because the minute this was pointed out, both men and women jumped on the informed consent bandwagon and it happened pretty quickly. But, um, you know, it's still not in other countries. You still don't have to give informed consent. So I think it's useful to think about that. Why was it that women's bodies were not thought of as an intimate area of control by the woman? So such that if you wanted to enter that area, you had to get informed consent. Well, you know, the woman was thought of as kind of a piece of property. And that's where objectification comes in. And then why would women be thought of as a piece of property? Because men were used to the fact that women were there for their interests and for their control. It wasn't so long ago that a married woman had no legal rights. She lost uh, under what was called coverture. She lost all of her property rights and other legal rights when she got married. She was just a, an adjunct of the man. So we haven't entirely lost that way of thinking. And when we talk about sex within marriage, some states still have some kind of exemption for marital sex, not a full exemption, but it's a lesser crime than other forms of rape. And yet a, a vast majority of sexual assaults take place in intimate relationships. And certainly a lot of these are marriages. So why would it be thought that a woman in a marriage has no right to say no to sex? Because it was this picture. She's a piece of property. She kind of mortgaged herself to the man and gave herself to him. Now he can use her the way he wants. So of course, we haven't gotten to sexual harassment yet, but this made it very, very difficult for women in the workplace to win respect for their dignity. So that was the next step. Uh, sexual harassment law, as I try to point out, is very different from sexual assault law because it's not a criminal law at all. It's a civil law under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's an offense of sex discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So that means that it's uniform across the whole country. But it also means that the defendant is actually not the, per the main perpetrator, but it's actually the employer and all kinds of 
complications come about about establishing employer liability, which we could talk about later if you want. But anyway, sexual harassment in the workplace, people just thought, oh, well, boys will be boys. You know, that's what they would say. I say in the book, men will be boys, because that, I mean, they really uh, gave a free pass to infantile and malign male behavior. But people, a lot of men, and I would say the vast majority of men, thought that this wasn't a good thing to do. They, it embarrassed them, and they thought these men were behaving badly. But they thought, oh, well, you know, that's just what men sometimes do, and it's embarrassing, but I don't know what to do about it. And I remember in my own graduate school days when there was a serial sexual harasser who was my thesis advisor, you know, we didn't complain because it didn't seem like it could possibly do any good. There was no grievance procedure. But one woman did complain. She just had had enough. She went to the department chair, who was a really good man, very good man. But he had no idea what to do because there was no code. So he called the perp in and he said, you know, you shouldn't really do this. And then of course, then all hell broke loose because this man then, he hadn't retaliated against me and all the others who said no, but he did retaliate against the one who blew the whistle. And to this day, she suffers for that. She got a worse job. You know, I, I make a great effort to cite her work and to really give her enormous credit because she was the one who took that risk for us all. And But then it achieved nothing. You have to have law because the well-intentioned males are not going to be willing to take a personal risk if you personalize it. So, so it has to be out there. It has to be a set of rules that apply to all. And once it did get there in, by the 1980s, it really has done tremendous good because men are educated. They're put on notice that this is illegal. It's gonna do you harm. It's gonna harm your career. And most men are not psychopaths. The ones who still offend, I think are ones who tend to be psychopaths. I won't name any names, but anyway, they, they do, the others are deterred. They're deterred and also they're educated. I think men now understand. What, what this is, but it took a lot of creative lawyering, particularly to get people to believe that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the non-discrimination law, applies to sexual harassment. You could see that it does single out both racial race discrimination and sex discrimination, but how could sexual harassment in the workplace possibly count as sex discrimination? So here, it was Catherine McKinnon who made a great contribution. She wasn't alone. There were lots of lawyers who were working alongside of her. And she was the first to say, I want to give credit to others, particularly an African-American lawyer named Pauli Murray, who was very, uh, very valuable in this struggle. But McKinnon's book, Sexual Harassment of Working Women, spelled out in great detail why it should be seen as an offense of discrimination. And she said, well, if you could look at it, you can look at it two ways. If you look at it on, on what she called the difference theory, the woman is being treated in a different way from a man in the same position, that's okay. But the theory she really preferred was what she called the dominance theory, which meant that you have to understand that what men are really doing is enforcing their superior power in the workplace. And then she got to work and found some cases, particularly the wonderful Meritor versus Vincent case, this is a woman who worked in this bank and her supervisor, what was so interesting was that the supervisor had sex with her with a, a sort of consent, but it, of course it was this kind of tainted consent. It was unwelcome, but not involuntary. That's what the courts had to learn, that you can make that distinction. Something could be voluntary in the sense that she wasn't technically assaulted, but it was still unwelcome. And so at that point, the courts recognized that there was an offense of sexual harassment, not just in the quid pro quo case where the person says, I'll fire you if you don't sleep with me, but also in what's now known as hostile environment cases where the persistent sexual overtures make life really, really bad. Now we have a lot of work still to do because what is a hostile environment? Pervasiveness and seriousness are the two hallmarks. But as I try to show, Courts are all over the map. Um, what counts is that our local judge, Diane Wood in the Seventh Circuit has written an excellent article 
going through the cases where the plaintiffs lose and saying, look, the fact patterns, they probably should have won in at least some of these cases. But judges don't quite recognize what is unwelcome. So they haven't fully taken on the job of trying to think from the woman's point of view. But anyway, we're, we're, we're still, we're making progress on that too. Well, and one point you made earlier was that sexual harassment law is very often misunderstood by the public and often confused with sexual assault law. And that seems yeah. exactly right. And, and then as you just said just now, um, what different courts understand to constitute a hostile work environment can vary a lot from place to place as well. And there can be, there are sort of uncertainty about the exact contours of the law, depending on what court you're in front of, what judge you're in front of. You know, lawyers often talk about sort of the gap between the law on the books and the law in practice. And so given those two facts you pointed out, I think it would be easy for someone to imagine that working conditions, you know, for women and for other people who might be sexually harassed um, may not have changed that much over time and that maybe things haven't improved significantly. But the story that you tell in the book is really quite different. And you tell um, a story in which uh, working conditions, uh, particularly for women, are really quite different now than they were uh, before these legal innovations occurred. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that and about what has made the difference, even given the sort of uncertainties about exactly where the law stands at any given moment. Well, I think having the law there is a great thing because it means that your dignity is asserted in the workplace. Now, that doesn't mean that if you go to court, you're going to win, but the law recognizes that you have a right to your dignity in the workplace. It's very slippery. I talk about the Anita Hill case. Of course, she never went to court, so we don't know what would have happened. But my prediction, what I say is that I think she probably should have won, but she probably would not have won because of the difficulty of d demonstrating pervasiveness and seriousness. To some male judges, this will look like joking and witty witticism. And there was another case in the Seventh Circuit that I talk about, very similar case called Baskerville versus Culligan, where Judge Posner, one of the great judges in this area, who had already made a landmark ruling in a different case of workplace sexual harassment. In this case, he says, well, this guy was just an oaf and it was all quite comical what he was doing. But I think he didn't really ask seriously enough, what would a woman who it seems was the only woman in the workplace he didn't even see fit to, to mention how many women were in the workplace. But she, you know, she was being teased in this really grotesquely oafish and but still implicitly threatening way. So I think often men just don't quite understand when joking is not, not really joking. And I think that is true in the Clarence Thomas case. Great. So I think now it makes sense to shift our focus a little bit to the second half of the book in which you talk about particular um, particular fora in which in which these sorts of issues um, are most maybe arise most saliently and most importantly these are these are the citadels of pride uh, as you describe them but I guess I want to start with one institution that is not uh, by your definition a citadel of pride and that's the academy uh, universities and colleges and so the the universities are not that that's a, a setting in which sexual harassment and sexual assault has been very much in the news um, in recent years and it's obviously a setting that's of particular importance to you and me since we both teach at a university um, but you um, you don't focus on universities and colleges you they are uh, given an interlude in the book rather than um, rather than a sort of a focused chapter and I guess I want to ask um, why that is and what you think are sort of what, what you think is particular or not particular about the university context when it comes to sexual assault and sexual harassment well we have to distinguish between the sexual harassment of employees, long-term employees, and sexual harassment involving students. I mean, often the vast majority of complaints are students against other students. So I wanna leave that to one side for a minute. But when you have long-term employees who've got a contract and they're in the workplace for a substantial time, whether it's in a law firm or whether it's in business, they can be informed and they know the rules and they're on notice. This is what you don't do. So that means that the ones who get caught usually are some, somehow very uh, unusual, let's put it that way. Now, there certainly are cases like the case of George Dominguez at Harvard, where he, he had been penalized once while I was teaching at Harvard. So you know how long ago that is. Well, I was on the faculty council with George and he was penalized for sexual overtures to another 
professor. And he suffered a penalty that's confidential, so we don't know what it was, but he wasn't fired. But apparently then he went on doing it for years and years and years and no one came forward and it just went on and on. And he eventually was fired, but it happened very late. There was another case in the philosophy department where there was somebody who, Burton Drebin, who harassed women again and again and again. And he was later fired. And when Brian Leiter and I wanted to write about it to show that this behavior has consequences, we checking out the facts, we found that he was actually fired for embezzlement, not for sexual harassment, because it was easier. It was easier because it was so clear. It was black and white that he had embezzled money and they didn't have to get into the messy he said, she said stuff about sexual harassment. So yeah, I mean, there are these difficult cases and the, the, the justice isn't always done. But I think, you know, looking at the academy that I'm in, comparing it to the one that I was in when I was a graduate student, all the world of difference. I think women are empowered. Uh, we had a case in our philosophy department where a young assistant professor wanted to have a relationship and she was a, a woman with a graduate student. But you know, the rules were there. So she went, went to the chair, there was a discussion and the chair said, well, if you're gonna have this relationship, and it was very nice that she actually came forward before the relationship had started. It's very unusual. Um, but he's, the chair said, look, you cannot supervise this person's work. You can't be at a meeting where this person's work will be discussed and assessed. And you know, it's worked out beautifully. And this student has done very, very well. And it may be that we'll even hire this person as a lecturer. So anyway, it just worked out very well. And I think that's the way things usually happen. They don't always happen that way, but you know, the, the cases that fall, fall afoul of this are often cases where, oh, it's emails. And the person like Colin McGinn at Miami, he said, oh, well, I thought this kind of sexy emailing was okay because it wasn't really a, a sexual overture as such. So there are these people. And I think the fact that he was British and he hadn't been educated in the <clears throat> American system was significant. Um, people have not been educated enough, but in general, men are educated and they're deterred. And I think that's great. And it's also true in law firms and in the business world. Now students, it's another matter. I talk a lot about these campus tribunals and it's a very big problem because in a large proportion of the cases, both parties are extremely drunk. So there are great gaps in memory, very hard to establish. Certainly beyond a reasonable doubt would be very hard. If you have a weaker standard such as preponderance of the evidence or the intermediate standard that's called clear and convincing evidence, you may sometimes get there, but it's still very hard. So that's why there's been so much fierce debate about what is the process that can be fair to the accused and still listen to the voices of complaint. My first recommendation is lower the drinking age because a lot of these things happen at parties where everyone is drinking, minor, under 21 and over 21, but adults can't be there because they would be committing a criminal offense by being there, they would be contributing to the delinquency of a minor. And so in places where adults can supervise the drinking, like Bowdoin College, for example, has a kind of deal with the local police. They say, we're not gonna arrest you, Don't just go supervise that party. Things are much better. So I wish we would lower the drinking age. And I think every college administrator I've ever talked to about this thinks so too. But beyond that, it's very hard to deal with these charges and counter charges. So the second thing that I would recommend and some universities are doing this, is give free legal counsel to the accused. The big pushback to campus tribunals from a lot of the law academics who saw them in action was that the accused are not given due process. And that was quite right, because you're allowed to have one adult with you, but that usually is not a lawyer and they try to discourage you from having a lawyer. No, everyone who's accused should have legal counsel and it should be free. Columbia has done that and I, we're in the process of doing that as well. So those are two things that would improve it. But I think, you know, the student thing is, is unusual because of the youth of the parties involved. And that's what makes it different from the normal workplace. So I think it's very interesting to think about um, what has changed in the sort of workplace culture and the ways in which you know, the 
faculty members who are professors at universities um, react and sort of the ways in which they engage with um, one another and how that interacts with sexual harassment law and has over time. But maybe the best way to do that is to bring in your first Citadel of Pride as a point of comparison. Your first Citadel, the institution, the, the first of the three institutions you identify as being a real sort of a locus of, of sexual harassment and sexual assault is the federal judiciary. Um, and I think that a lot of people from a distance might think that the federal judiciary and universities have really quite a lot in common. In both cases, you have people who hold their jobs for very long periods of time and are protected by some form of sort of salary and tenure protection in the federal judiciary, the constitution, protects federal judges in universities, academics have tenure. Um, and yet you describe the federal judiciary in very different terms than, than the academy. So, so wh what's, what do you think is, um, is a sort of a resident in the federal judiciary that's causing it to be such a citadel of pride and how, how does it differ then from university settings? Well, the first thing is the huge amount of secrecy. There has to be, of course, secrecy and confidentiality the, the clerks, we're talking really about clerks who are working for the judge, and they're the ones who are typically the victims of this harassment. And of course, it's right for them to be bound to secrecy with regard to the cases that they're working on. But for a long time, this secrecy was boundless. It lasted forever after you were long out of the chamber, and it lasted with regard to every topic. So there, the code of judicial conduct was just totally hopeless. It did care a lot about corruption, but not about sex. So, you know, you just thought you couldn't say that these two judges that I talk about, Judge Kaczynski and Judge Reinhardt, you couldn't tell what they had been doing in the chambers, if you were the victim, if you were a witness, whatever, because you were bound by this oath of confidentiality. Finally, now Judge Chief Justice Roberts called for a a working group to recommend reforms. And now we have reforms that say very clearly that whistleblowing is not just okay, but it's re recommended and incentivized. So things are getting better, but I still think the other big difference in between this and the academy is the fact, the structure of the clerkship. Now you, I was never a clerk, you were a clerk to Judge Posner who of all the um, mentors of clerks, I'm sure he was one of the most gentle and supportive and helpful. So totally unlike what we're talking about. I mean, the idea that he would harass or even bully a clerk would be totally unthinkable. But it's still a bad structure because you're tied to one person and you're tied to that person, not just for the time you're clerking, but for the rest of your career. Because when you apply for a job in the legal academy, first thing they wanna do is talk to your judge. And so people, therefore have to keep on good terms with that judge forever. And I think that's a bad structure. Now the academy used to be sort of like that, but it's become much less like that. In our department, for example, every dissertation is done with a three person committee. And even though maybe one is called the first reader, usually we forget who that is. And when we have to file the paper, we say, well, Gabriel, were you the first reader or was I? Because we all three meet together with the candidate. And that is as it should be, because very important to have divided power and very important for each person to hear what the others are saying. It makes for much better dissertations. So now the power is more divided. And then of course, the minute that you're on the job market or you're publishing, you're not in the hands of that one person anymore. So my thesis supervisor, who was certainly alone and, and he was the only one in that field, I actually, as I say, he didn't retaliate against me, but if he had, he would have been out of the picture pretty soon anyway. As it happened, he died before I came up for tenure and I could have wished he hadn't died because he actually supported me. But, but in any case, he, um, he was out of the picture because I had published a book. Everyone could read the book. You could send it to experts who would read it, but that's not the way the relationship between judge and clerk works because you want to know other things of course, the publications that the person has can be read by many, but the judge is usually asked, well, how is this person to work with? And the judge will say, oh, this was one of the best clerks I've ever had. Mazur was so quick on the uptake. And, you know, I'm sure Dick said that about you and that that played non-negligible role in our interest in hiring you. But it should be 
more divided. And I, so my recommendation is that there would be more like a committee clerkship that people could move around from judge to judge. I think you would lose nothing. You would gain a lot. You would learn how different judges do things. It would be nice if you could rotate from Dick Posner to Diane Wood and you know just see a different chamber. So that's not gonna happen. No one wants it to happen but me. But anyway, that's what I think would have to happen to, to get on top of the problem. One thing that I think is really interesting about this analysis is that if I understand correctly, you're not saying that particular institutions are more or less filled with prideful men who are given to object, objectif objectification of others. I mean, the universities are surely filled with prideful people, but, but then instead, I think what you're saying is that certain institutions are structured in ways that allow people who are prideful to take advantage of others and other institutions are structured such as so as to not provide such a fertile ground. And that it's really these sort of small structural changes like one person committee versus three person committees or codes of silence and things like that, that, that make, can make all the difference in translating the attitudes of the people involved into their behavior and how it affects uh, the people that they might victimize. Yeah, absolutely. I think these two judges I discussed, if they had been professors in our law school, they could not have gotten away with it. I mean, the fact is that we all knew how Kaczynski was carrying on. And we, often, I think our law school didn't recommend people to his chambers for quite a long time, but other places still did. Uh, another case I talk about later in the arts chapter, a singer named David Daniels, who was facing both criminal charges and sexual harassment complaints. He had the ill-advised uh, choice to go work in a university, I mean, ill-advised for him. His voice was getting a little bit old, and I guess he thought having a teaching position at the University of Michigan, where he had studied, would be a good fallback in, as his career declined. But the minute he got to a university context, students complained, and they knew who to complain to. And immediately the wheels started turning, and within two years, he was tossed out. So that's the, the thing. When you have a, a good structure and where the people know who to complain to and where somebody acts on the complaint, then things don't happen in the, in the same way. Now in the arts, why, why do things not happen? Well, because each gig is a short-term thing. You're not in one workplace for very long. And sure, the rumors follow David Daniels. Everyone knew there were those sort of rumors because even when he first got to Michigan, people said, oh, you better watch out for your students. But you know, each gig was separate. And so it didn't really pay to investigate it all the way down if you were gonna be rid of him the next year anyway. And that is true of the theater world, the film world. It's not always true in all countries. I know tenured actors in Sweden, in the Royal National Dramatic Theater. They're great friends of mine because I spend a lot of time in, in Scandinavia. And you know, they're sort of like professors in, in America. They have much greater security. They feel better. They are less competitive in the bad sense because they have tenure in a reputable institution. But anyway, in most of the performing arts, it's just not that way at all. And that also means that one big powerful person in that field, whether it be a Harvey Weinstein or a James Levine, can really blight the world for lots and lots of people. Even if you're not employed by Harvey Weinstein now, you might be down the road. You know, you can't afford to fall afoul of Harvey Weinstein because he's just too big. And James Levine was the same thing. Everyone knew that James Levine was harassing young men. I first heard about it before I even went to graduate school. It was like about 1969, 1970, because I knew people who played in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and they, they talked about this quite openly. But he was a big talent. He made money for other people. It was paid, paid them to look the other way. And the young people just, couldn't come forward if they wanted to stay in that world. Well, there were some who just dropped out of that world because they were so traumatized. But they, even they, they were so traumatized, they didn't come forward. So it did take a kind of snowball effect for the ones who were uh, harassed by James Devine to come forward. But that's the, the difference that in the academy, sure, people move around, but they usually have long-term contracts. And so you have to be on good behavior for a certain length of time. And I would say, Maybe people will, will say I'm wrong about this. There's no one in the academy who plays the role of Harvey Weinstein. If somebody hates you, 
Well, okay, that's one person. But if you take that notorious case of Avital Ronell, the, the woman that got in, in Judith Butler defended her and then decided maybe it was wrong to have defended her. Anyway, she was an English professor at NYU who harassed a, a young male graduate student. You know, I mean, yes, for a while until it came to light, she had that kind of cramping power over that guy's career. But the minute it comes to light, all kinds of people I know in the English world say, well, that's terrible. Let's help this guy out. You know, and, and uh, that, that does happen. I, I, there's a person in philosophy that I, I won't, I think, name because he was officially not convicted, although I think he should have been. But we all formed a committee to say, let's help out women who have been harassed by X and let's help them with their work and help them get jobs. And I, I volunteered for one particular woman who is a wonderful philosopher who now has tenure at University of Rochester. So, you know, that's what happens if there's the power is spread around enough. So I don't think any one individual can blight the, 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 a promising career, except, of course, by inflicting trauma. And that we, we always have to take account of. But if you know that there's someone out there or a lot of people out there who will help you, I mean, this effort to help this, these women who were harassed by X was very organized. I got a letter from my friend Dave Estland at Brown saying, will you join our effort? Will you agree to help? Why? And, and, and you know, so we did. And I think that's the sort of thing that cannot happen in the performing arts. Performing arts, you know, it's so subjective, unfortunately, particularly acting. So the reasons not to give somebody an acting job are so many. And for every job, there are probably 2,000 people who could fill it well. So that means that one big character has great power. Music is a little bit better because auditions are behind a curtain. But even then, you know, the early stages of the career, and that's where Levine did his damage. You haven't gotten to that point yet, and you're just trying to get your foot on the ladder. It's, it's very subjective. How do you sound? Do you sound like somebody who would really make a, a difference in the world? So I feel it's that element of subjectivity combined with the lack of structure. Now, I've proposed in the book that the unions should really supply the structure. And they're beginning to do that, both AGVA and the American uh, the Music, uh, I can't remember the name of the music union. Anyway, the American Guild of Musicians, I think it is. They have gotten now much stiffer, they have much better rules, and they hold the actual employers to account. So that if San Francisco Opera is about to hire somebody and then the uh, AGVA says, you know, this person has a sexual harassment problem, then the company will talk to them and they'll engage in a serious deliberation. And then, that I, so, and then of course, the companies themselves have increasingly adopted sexual harassment rules and procedures. I teach a class with Anthony Freud, the gen general director and CEO of Lyric Opera of Chicago. And I know very well that concern for sexual harassment rules and procedures in the chorus, the orchestra, and of course, the people who are hired for solo roles is tremendous. And we even have, as the chair of our board of trustees, Sylvia Neal, who's a lawyer, who is primarily concerned with feminist issues. So to put her in as the chair of the board of trustees was quite, I think, a, a bold stroke. So I think things are getting better, but we still need to think about it and, and, and worry and, and have concerns for when we interview guests on our class, we ask them about discrimination that they've suffered and what, what they think. And I think there is still work to be done for the young and vulnerable artists. And I think that, you know, we're of course talking about your second Citadel of Pride, which is the, uh, the performing arts. It's the world that you are yourself very personally familiar with given your work and your training as an actor and as a singer. And I think that this sort of contrast in the way that those institutions are organized compared with the way that other sorts of institutions are organized really throws into stark relief the, 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 the manner in which um, it's sort of this type of exploitation and discrimination is possible in that world um, to, a, in, to an extent that is not equaled uh, in a lot of other places. So I think we would be uh, remiss if we didn't talk somewhat about your third Citadel of Pride as well, which I think will strike many people as um, the most controversial uh, um, or, or most objectionable area um, in which you're looking to intervene. And that is the world of college sports. Um, so what is it exactly that has made 
college sports, and you really do focus on college sports rather than professional sports. What is it that has made college sports such a fertile ground for um, sexual assault and sexual harassment? And, and what are the types of reforms that could conceivably be effective uh, that world? Yeah. Well, of course, I do talk about professional sports first as a, as a contrast. Right. That is increasingly like universities in the sense that there are formal rules and procedures that are agreed to as part of the collective bargaining agreement between the players union and the management. And it's pretty strong in basketball and in baseball. Football, the rules are a little less strong, but they get, it's getting better. And what happened with Deshaun Watson, I think is an example of how a, a serial malefactor will be brought to account in baseball. Wow, <laughs> my ex-husband is a Yankees fan and he's so annoyed that Herman was taken out of pitching for like a year and a half for domestic violence. But of course he thought it was quite the right thing for them to do and he had indeed broken the rules. So anyway, college sports, the problem is this, that there's a collective action problem. There are very few talents each year, let's say, at the college level. I'm talking about football and basketball now, not so much about other sports. And they're all competing. All the 150 Division I schools are competing for a very small talent pool. So they, if one of them says, well, to come here, you're going to have to accept very strict rules. We're going to be watching you. We're not going to allow you to have sex with women against their consent and so on, that school will very likely lose some big talents. Because even if they're not going to offend, they don't like that idea that they're going to be policed. So that has caused even the ones that used to have very good standards, Notre Dame I talk about here, to lower their standards. They actually let in someone who was already known to be quite terrible because he had assaulted his teacher in high school, throwing a desk at her. And of course, soon enough, he did rape a woman, not a Notre Dame student, but a St. Mary's student. And she committed suicide. So then Notre Dame tried to cover it up. And uh, it, by the time he got to the pros, though, he was caught. He killed his girlfriend's dog. Really gruesome. It was a tiny little dog. And this big football player crushed pretty much all the bones and organs in this dog's body. But the Hawks let him go right away. So that was all right. So the Falcons, I mean, Atlanta Falcons. And um, so the college football players, everyone wants to cover it up. I take as a particular example, the case of Jameis Winston, who was at Florida State. And I want to say now that so far, I think Jameis Winston in the pros is shaping up. He's becoming a much finer person and uh, making up for the indulgences that he committed when he was an undergraduate, but he did apparently with very convincing evidence and it was settled out of court, uh, rape a woman and they all covered up for him. The whole town of Tallahassee was, you know, they were filled with sports fans and it wasn't just emotional sports fans, but there are these investment groups that invest, apparel companies and the like that invest in the college sport and make it particularly with football, the huge expense of football possible, who get into the act and they really exert leverage over the president, over the academic process. There's academic corruption here too, of course. So I don't think that that is really reformable. Basketball, I think the solution is clear. And I've talked to Adam Silver, our U of Chicago Law School alum about this. And he actually added a blurb to my book very kindly. Adam Silver thinks the solution is to go the direction of baseball, have minor leagues where people get a salary and you just skip the colleges. And right now it's already happened because basketball bodies mature earlier. Look at our Patrick Williams, who's only 19 and he's a starter, he's incredible. And the G League and then the European leagues serve as minor leagues for the NBA. So pretty soon that problem will be solved with D1 college basketball going down the drain. But football is so expensive. The facilities are expensive and they really need these apparel companies to pay the bill. So what are they gonna do? Well, the Supreme Court may well say they have to treat them as professionals, as salary pro professionals. I think the Supreme Court will and should say that. And that will really explode the whole thing because then 
the pretense that they're actually student athletes will be gone, but it will be still quite intolerable because how can you have people on your roster as students who are getting paid a salary for playing football? So it will be exposed for what it is, but it's still an intolerable situation. I guess I just think in the long run, division one football has to go, but it may not be quick. It may not be until football itself dies a natural death through the CTE and all the problems that it has. I don't know, but I think no one is willing to create minor leagues there the way that Gatorade has stepped up. The G League is funded largely by Gatorade. And so if that happened, it would be a different thing. But because the facilities are expensive, I think it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Meanwhile, universities should no longer collaborate in this horrible disgrace of academic corruption and sexual corruption. I think that, you know, very quickly as a last point, you know, it's very interesting that you bring up um, the recent Supreme Court case that has been heard but not yet decided about the amateurization or professionalization of college sports and in particular college football and whether college football players can be paid or whether the NCAA can continue to prohibit them from being paid. I guess I wonder if in fact the Supreme Court decides that um, college football players should be paid as if they were professionals, is it possible that some of the institutions that make professional sports um, uh, sort of a safer place and that allow professional sports to control this type of behavior more effectively, that those institutions might be imported into the college ranks, or that college football might even become sort of professionalized in such a way as to alleviate at least some of the problems that you described? Well, you know, not impossible, but I think one bad sign was that when Condoleezza Rice shared a commission on the problems in college basketball, and of course she's famous for being a tremendous football fan. I'm sure if anyone in football had wanted to collaborate with her on that, we would know that. But it was just basketball that had this report, which was an excellent report, although I think by now it's, it's not necessary anymore for the reasons I said. But the fact that football didn't wanna go there, that, that, that just means they, they're not looking for solutions. What if they're paid, what will they be? I think they cannot be students and be paid full time to pay, play football. So are they just gonna be a hired entertainment group? That's basically what I think it would be. You know, like you hire a string quartet to be in residence at your university. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but then you have to lose the pretense that these are actually student athletes. And I, for all sorts of reasons, I don't think the apparel companies want that. For one thing, they so far get great tax advantages from the pretense that they're educating students and that these students are, these athletes are really students. So they're, they're not gonna want that. And I, I don't know what, what we should say about that. I think a lot of the players would actually like to have a fallback career. And this is what Adam Silver is trying to do in, in the G League and so on to set up learning academies so they actually have a fallback career if their professional sports career doesn't work out. So if they're not students, I think a lot of the athletes don't want it either. So, well, I'll watch with great interest to see what happens. Well, there's obviously so much more to be said, but I think it's time now for us to conclude our conversation. It's been really a pleasure talking with you about Citadels of Pride. Uh, your new book. And um, Martha, this is uh, this has been enlightening uh, and interesting and and in, in parts, you know, hopeful and uh, and also uh, somewhat despairing. But uh, but I think your discussion of the ways in which institutions can shape the lives of the people within them uh, points a way forward, at least, and, and something um, that, that lawyers and non-lawyers can think about. So thank you very much. And thank you so much, Jonathan, for taking your time away from your busy teaching schedule to do this. Very grateful.